I'm Ken Harbaugh. What could possibly go wrong? This is Burn the Boats, a show about making tough calls in tough times. America today faces a critical test. Our democracy is under threat. But good people are rising to the challenge. Now is the time to go all in. Now we burn the boats. My guest today is Garrett Reisman, a former NASA astronaut who's been to space three times. After leaving NASA in 2011, Garrett joined SpaceX, where he served as the director of space operations. He's currently a senior advisor at the company and a professor of astronautical engineering at USC. Garrett, thanks for joining us on Burn the Boats. Uh, thanks, Ken. Great to be here. You know, and I never really usually correct people. Even if, but you got my name right. You said you pronounce astronautical engineering right, which I'm really impressed. Most people get those two things wrong. But I've actually only been to space two times. Oh, but uh, I, I three, have. How does it? How does the three missions work? Yeah, I know that's a neat little trick, huh? Uh, I, fl- I've, I did. I did fly in all three space shuttles that we had. Um, so that was a neat little trick. And 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 I've I've been to space only two times. I have been to Earth three times. That is true. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and the way I did that was, um, I, on my first mission, it was a long duration mission. So I launched on Endeavor and then I came home on Discovery. Uh, and, and then, so I got two shuttles, one mission. So I only, I only launched twice, but I flew in, uh, uh on all three shuttles because my third mission was on Atlantis. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to get to more of that. I have been really not just looking forward to this interview, but trying to figure it out because I listen to you on on Joe Rogan and a couple other shows, and you don't get political. Uh, but <laughs> given my audience, I'm going to figure out how to get you there today. So, uh, are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. That's that's cool. I'm fine. Actually, if you follow my Twitter feed, I, I do get political on occasion, so it's 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 fine. Good. We'll get it out of you. Um, I want right. to. We, we interviewed Charles Bolden, the NASA administrator. A while ago, it was right before Russia invaded Ukraine, and he seemed to have this unshakable faith in the power of cooperation in space to overcome whatever earthly disagreements we may have down here. He was talking, of course, about Russia and the U.S. on the International Space Station. But I feel like the world has changed since then, and I'd love your take on on where you stand on cooperating with a regime like Putin's, even if it's in, in space. Uh, I imagine you have worked alongside cosmonauts. Yes. So, uh, in fact, during two of the months I was on the International Space Station, it was myself and two Russian cosmonauts. Uh, and um, so, so yeah, I've been there. And the way we handle that is uh, we just are professional when we're doing operational things and, and focus on the mission and focus on what the day to day stuff. And it's kind of like it's kind of like Thanksgiving dinner with your family. You try not to bring up politics or religion or anything that's going to, uh, you know, mess with your crew camaraderie, um, which as a pilot, you understand how important that is uh, in an operational uh, setting. But and, and there there have always been frictions, especially at the geopolitical level, even back in 2008, when I was up there. Uh, nothing nearly as, as extreme as, as what's going on now, though. So you're right. Things now are different. And, and I, I have to admit that when I see our astronauts up there and uh, uh, crews departing and arriving and cosmonauts and, and astronauts getting together, giving each other big bear hugs and, and slapping high fives and whatnot, it does it, – it's incongruous. It, 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 it does not seem right, f- frankly, with, with what's – given the reality of what's happening back here on Earth – I really do hope that one day we can evolve to a point where we have this Star Trek future where everybody, no matter what their nationality or race or gender or religion, we have this big, happy, united humanity going forth in space. And I do believe that space should be an international cooperative place. But at the same time, you can't ignore what's happening uh, on the ground by 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 these, by, by, you know, the reality of what's happening. So I, I, I disagree a little bit with Charlie on this. And I do think that, uh, that, that, that is, that is, that we need to face reality basically. Uh, Well, I think Charlie has probably come around. Uh, the facts on the ground have, I would imagine forced that, but you have talked about, 
um, kicking Russia off the ISS, given their behavior on the ground. And, and that's not a commentary on the character of the cosmonauts who you worked alongside. It's about geopolitical reality, right? That's correct. And and, and not so much uh, – kicking them off is, is, uh, is, is hard. Uh, and, and there's a good reason why uh, – it, it, why this cooperation is still going. And that is, uh, the reason is that we have no choice. <laughs> uh, both sides are completely dependent on one another. It's, it's an interdependent system. The, the Russian segment of the space station can't operate without the electrical power supplied by the American segment. The American segment and the rest of uh, the, the, you know, the European segment, the Japanese segment, the, all those segments can't operate without the propulsion capabilities supplied by the Russian segment. So if either side pulls out, it's the end of the ISS. And both uh, uh, the United States and Russia have invested way too much to just walk away from this thing at this point, given that it still has some useful life left. So we're, 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 it's kind of a shotgun wedding, uh, and there's no conscious or uh, – what, what, how did Gwyneth Paltrow put it? Like, uh, uh, um, I, the, Whatever the uh, amicable uh, divorce in Hollywood is these days, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's no, there's no like a, a happy end to this, uh, uh, and and so, and so we're stuck. But we have an opportunity, um, and and so relatively recently, just a few months ago, Russia made yet another pronouncement that they're pulling out, and it's hard to take it seriously because they've said this so many times that they're leaving, they're leaving, and then at the end of the day, they they don't leave. And I and I have my uh, uh, suspicions as to why they don't leave, but they don't. And so it, it's very difficult for NASA or anybody to take them seriously because they've, they're saying it again. It's a little bit different this time because it came right after a meeting with Putin himself. So it seems to have the blessing from the dear leader. And, um, and then the other thing was it wasn't like we're leaving tomorrow. Uh, it wasn't like a bluster. It wasn't like a Rogozin, who was a, the previously was the head of Roscosmos, he put out this like, little music video where we, they abandoned an American astronaut, Mark Van Hey, on the, on the space station and said, dos vidanya. Um, and, and it, no, that's, that's just bluster. That's, we never take that seriously. But this is a little different because they're not saying we're leaving tomorrow. They said we're leaving in two years. They said, um, you know, 2024. So if, if I were the NASA administrator, you know, I would take them at their word. Why not? They said it. Why, why, why wouldn't we take our partner seriously, right? And I think we have two years to, to put together a crash program to replace that Russian propulsion capability so that we could have so that the ISS could continue uh, without the Russians involvement. And then two years from now, if we're ready, just say, OK, you said you're leaving. It's time for you to leave. You said you had your suspicions as to why in the past it's been all bluster. Uh, can you share that with us? Yeah, it, it's a simple reason, actually, is that without the ISS, without the International Space Station, Russia does not have a space program of any merit whatsoever. And if, the, if there is one thing that's, you know, dear and important to Putin, as you well know, it's the, at least the perception that he's running a superpower. And superpowers have space programs, human space programs. That's what they do. Now, right now, the ISS is really the only thing that Roscosmos has going for him in, in terms of human spaceflight. The United States and other countries are working on new programs. We have a lot on the, on, both on the drawing board and about to launch as far as we're going back to the moon with the Artemis program. SpaceX is working on Starship. There's so many things happening right now that we have to look forward to. Russia has none of that, absolutely nothing. If, the only thing, if without the ISS, the only thing they'd be left with for a space program would be launching Soyuz capsules that would do maybe a, a, a few days of orbits and splashing down. They'd be back, basically back to like the Gemini days uh, or... In their, in their case, the, the Vashad days. Um, so it would set them way back to a very primitive program. And you might say, well, couldn't they just fly to the Chinese space station? Well, the, the thing is they can't because the, the orbit that that Chinese space uh, station is in is not reachable uh, with their rockets and their launch sites. They could, you know, go out with their hat in hand and ask the Chinese to take one of their cosmonauts up to their space station but again, that, that would be a very secondary subservient position for Russia and be hardly befitting a, a superpower. So, so really, as far as projecting that soft power or that illusion of, uh, of strength, uh, the only way for Putin really to do, that, to do that is to maintain their partnership in the ISS.
You mentioned the Artemis mission and the struggle to get back to the moon. That's a, a stepping stone to Mars, right? Uh, yes. So, so uh, I, I certainly view it that way, and I know NASA uh, wants to view it that way. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's this debate that's raged uh, for decades now. Like, should we go after the ISS? Should we go back to the moon should we, or just go for Mars? And there's been a lot of uh, good reasons put forth on both sides of that debate. But um, it's one of the few times today you'll hear me say that it's okay to say both sides. <laughs> uh, you know, it should be considered uh, equally. Because it, 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 is, it, is a, it is something that could go either way. And, and, um, and, and there are good reasons to do both. Uh, you know, if you, if you look at, uh, I've talked to Elon Musk about this, and, and he's, uh, you know, at least initially was all about going to Mars uh, because he believes we have this window where we have the technical capability right now to send, some, to send humans to Mars. And you don't know how long that window is going to stay open, right? We've had plenty of examples in human history where technology didn't develop in a, in a purely monotonic fashion. In other words, it wasn't all up, 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 up. There were setbacks. You know, we had dark ages where certain technologies were lost for periods of time until we got them back. So it's quite possible that you know, just because we have the capability right now doesn't mean that 20, 30, 100 years from now we'll still have the capability. So in his mind, he wants to get on with it, and I get that. Um, and on the other hand, uh, there's good reasons to go back to the moon first, because there's still a lot we don't know, uh, that would be nice to know before we send humans to Mars. And the biggest thing probably is, um, has to do with radiation. So there's a lot of, of nasty radiation, uh, once you go out, uh, back to the moon or onto Mars. So I was, when I was on the space shuttle and on the space station, we we're above the atmosphere, but we're still pretty close to earth. You know, we're only about uh, 300 kilometers up or just a little bit over 200 miles. Um, and uh, that's not far, right? 200 miles, that's, that's pretty darn close. The moon is a quarter of a million miles away, right? So, so uh, we're above all the atmosphere when we're on the space station. But we're still, the, the key is we're still well below the Earth's magnetic field. And that magnetic field, the Earth, is what protects all of us, not only uh, while we're on the space station, but all of us down here on Earth, from those harmful radiation, uh, the, the harmful radiation that's out there outside the Earth's magnetic field. It's like a shield, like a force field, if you will. So if we go back to the moon, you, we have to deal with that. And the way we dealt with it during Apollo is we just didn't stay very long. You know, those missions were like a week or two. Uh, so if we uh, want to go to Mars, there's no option to go to Mars for a week. Right? If you're going, you're going for a couple of years. Uh, and, and so... Once you, if you just just go for it, then you're committing uh, to put people in that radiation environment for that long. Now we know exactly what kind of radiation is out there. We've had very sensitive instruments that have gone on all of our Mars probes and our rovers and other spacecraft we sent out beyond the Earth's magnetic field. So we know precisely what ions are out there and how much energy they have and what the flux is. We've measured all that. What we don't know is what does all that stuff do to the human body, okay? Because there's no direct comparison that we have. The closest thing we have, as far as data goes, uh, is, is from accidents and radiation with radiation workers or from survivors of nuclear, uh, the nuclear bombs in World War II, which, is, uh, which again, is not really, it's not really apples to apples either, because then we're talking about very high doses over short periods of time, as opposed to lower doses over long periods of time. So the bottom line is, we don't really know what's going to happen to people. And so one way we can learn kind of safely is we can go to the moon and put people into that environment and stay for a couple of weeks. Then we can stay for a couple of months. Then we can stay for a year. And we could do this in a kind of a building block fashion. Uh, and, then, and then we'll know. Uh, we'll have data. And, uh, and then we can go to Mars and we can know what kind of risk we're really taking. Uh, so that's, in my, in my view, that's the most useful thing about going to, to the moon first. Uh, so, but... You know, maybe we just go for it. I don't know. Are there are there any astronauts who don't think that going to Mars is a good idea? Not for the technical reasons, not for the scientific challenge it poses, but because they're looking at what's going on down here and and thinking, you know what, uh, we got to get our shit together first. 
Well, yeah, so I don't think you can find any astronauts that say that they don't think it's a good idea one day for us to go to Mars. Um, I think uh, none of my buddies would say that. <laughs> so I, I don't know. Maybe there's somebody out there that's, uh, that's, uh, that would say that. But um, the, 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 the argument that, uh, you know, why are we – this was the argument that was made during Apollo. Why are we spending all this money on, on flying to the moon when we have all these problems to deal with on Earth? And um, I think that argument has merit. Uh, and I think if we were spending a good percentage of our federal budget or our GDP on human space exploration, that would be a mistake because that would compromise our efforts to address uh, climate change and address, uh, you know, the war in Ukraine or address uh, energy prices or address, you know, all, all the myriad of homelessness, all the myriad of, of, of problems that we have down here on Earth. But we're not. We're not spending like 50 percent of our GDP or even 25 percent of our federal budget. We're, you, you know how much how much uh, if you take NASA's budget. And you divide by the total federal budget. Do you know what percent? I don't. It's half of one percent. So for every tax dollar that that a taxpayer pays, one half of one penny goes to NASA. And that's not just for like the Artemis program for the moon or the or the human space flight. That's for the James Webb Space Telescope. That's for the helicopter on Mars, the Perseverance rover, all the things that NASA does. They do it on one half of one percent. Of the U.S. Of, of the U.S. tax dollar, so at that rate of expenditure, if if we shut down NASA entirely and stopped exploring space, would it move the needle at all? On on uh, if we just you know if we just had one half of one percent more budget to spend, no, it's not going to make any measurable difference. Uh, so, so I I don't I think that that rate of expenditure is appropriate given the return on that investment and the fact that. It's an investment in our future that will pay dividends down the road. I think it's a smart play. I'm not, I'm not advocating ramping. I would advocate ramping it up to 1%, but I'm not going to advocate ramping it up to 10 or 20 because I do think we have other, other things we have to do. And the ultimate argument isn't that you know we need a backup planet. It's that we're a species that has that desire to explore in our DNA, and this is the public expression of that. Is that a fair uh, – is that a, a fair – uh, s summary of of your philosophy on it i i would say it's both i mean yes it, it's tr it's human nature to explore and 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 that's what we do um but you could and there are people out there um who including a, a past uh president of the planetary society who believes that uh we could just do it all with vr you know we could send these machines out there we put on those goggles and pretend you're walking around on mars and, um, you know, th th there might be some uh, something to say for that. I, I mean, it is kind of fun to go on Google Earth, right, and go, like, walk around the streets of Paris or something and look around. That's kind of cool. Not, but it's not as cool as going to Paris. Uh, so I don't think that ever will truly be satisfying from that perspective. But I do think that um, there is something to to this idea of survival of the species, and that is, I think, Ultimately, maybe the strongest motivation to actually go and, and have a and, and that is what's driving Elon. I could tell you that um, the idea is that uh, we have essentially all of our eggs in this one basket here on Earth. And let me make something very clear. And uh, Elon or, or Jeff Bezos or any of these guys that are proponents of, of sending large numbers of people out into the solar system and getting off of Earth. None of them are saying that Earth is a disposable planet. All right, we're not saying that, well, you know, we've kind of wrecked this place with climate change. Let's just get out of here and, and move on to the next one. That is not what they're saying. In fact, Elon, his plan A was to deal with climate change by electrifying all of our personal transportation, which is why he created Tesla, right? So so that's, that's plan. Plan A is definitely preserve this place. And I could tell you there is no place as well suited for human habitation and life than Earth. I mean, we evolved on this planet. We are our organism is particularly well suited for 14.7 psi atmospheric pressure, 80 percent nitrogen, 20 percent oxygen, uh, and one g. Uh, our bodies are built for that. Our skeletons are built for that. Everything about it, any place we go is not going to treat us nearly as well as this place. Not to mention the fact this is the only planet in the known universe where there's pizza. All right, which is not not trivial um having lived 
up there for three months without pizza, I can tell you that. So, um, so for all those reasons, nobody's saying that, that we want to get rid of Earth and move on. But we have to be somewhat realistic. There have been multiple, I think, seven extinction events, including the most famous one, the one that took out the dinosaurs when we got hit by an asteroid. But that was not the only extinction event over the course of Earth's um, history. If you go back billions of years, we had uh, you know periods of time where there was so much volcanic activity that there was really no survivable um, uh, or, 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 or animal life on the planet. And, and, and nearly near, all, all life was nearly extinguished. Um, so... They're, 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 the Earth has gone through all these different cataclysmic events, and there's going to be another one. Uh, it could be an asteroid, another asteroid. It could be, um, you know, a super volcano like uh, like Yellowstone going berserk. There's a lot, or, or and, and most likely we could do it ourselves with climate change or nuclear war. Uh, so we, it's perfectly perfectly within our capability to create our own extinction event. Now, you so for all those reasons. We, yeah, I'm go sorry. ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so for all those reasons, um, it would be great if we did have uh, another option. If we had a, a self-sustaining colony somewhere else in the solar system, where if the Earth does have another extinction event, human life will still go on. I think that is a valuable insurance policy and one worth pursuing. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching Burn the Boats. We'll get back to it in a minute. You have made this Midas Touch partnership a resounding success. Burn the Boats is approaching a million views in just the past few months, and I want to share that success. So I'll be profiling a few other shows and podcasts that I really love, starting with Wild Precious Life. If you're a reader, especially if you love insightful conversations with the most interesting and impactful writers of our time, Wild Precious Life is worth a listen. I'll let the show's host, Anne-Marie Kelly, tell you a little more. Wild Precious Life is a show about making the most of the time we have. Each week, we talk with prize-winning writers, artists, and wanderers who teach all of us what it means to be curious, wild, and brave. At Wild Precious Life, we never run out of stories, so you can dwell in possibility, dream with your eyes open, and say yes to hope, connection, and love. Especially when days seem overwhelming. Come walk, talk, dream, and discover Wild Precious Life. Listening is like catching up with an old friend. So, if you love books or music or chocolate or joy... Subscribe and follow Wild Precious Life wherever you listen to podcasts and get the first episode in your feed today. Thanks, everyone. I hope you'll check out Wild Precious Life wherever you get your podcasts. You worked at SpaceX. Do you have any reservations at all about billionaires like Elon, like Jeff Bezos, leading the charge and in... in not an insignificant way, basically making policy for the the human race. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's a that's a that's a thorny that's a difficult question. Um, I think first of all, I'm I'm actually grateful to to to, in, in, uh, to Elon and to Jeff and to Richard because they are Richard committing Branson, a lot of their capital. The, the third one, right? Richard Branson, yeah. yes, uh, who is, who's another billionaire that's that's devoting a lot of his resources to human spaceflight. So. So those three individuals have, you know, they, they've they've all ponied up the cash uh, and 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 put their own uh, efforts in, into this in, in, with with great vigor, and have really revitalized this whole industry and and really disrupted the industry. Uh, there's been tremendous advantages, and and NASA has been a beneficiary of of a lot of it, and and so. In, in, in a certain sense, yeah, I, I am. I admire what they've done, and and I appreciate what they've done. Uh, and you know, I, I, I do think though that there is, there, there is a, 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 a risk. One, one thing that, that we have to be very clear about is that so far anyway, in, in the, in the area of orbital human spaceflight, uh, it's not just been a, a, a SpaceX or a company, uh, any individual company or any individual billionaire that's really set the policy. It's been a partnership with NASA. So the, 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 the SpaceX crew dragon, the Falcon 9 rocket, the Boeing Starliner; those were all developed in partnership with NASA in a public-private partnership, where the um, the design and the certification of the vehicle was was done uh, uh, together with the government. And in a lot of ways, is is no different from the way NASA has always done this. Uh, you know, NASA has always had a, a private company 
build their vehicles. There was not like a, a factory with civil servants in it that built the Saturn V rocket. I mean, part of a variant of the Saturn V was built by the Chrysler Corporation. Okay, so there's always been private companies involved. Uh, it's just that what's happening now is a different relationship and kind of giving the private company more freedom to, to innovate and to do things their own way. And that's, that's had benefits for both sides. It's also a difference in, in IP ownership, so uh, intellectual property. The, the companies, SpaceX owns and operates those rockets and those spacecraft. Uh, and then they could turn around and use those rockets and spacecraft for private missions, where Rockwell that built the space shuttle could never do that. That was not part of the contract. They couldn't build another spaceship or even use the existing uh, shuttle and sell tickets. That, that was against the law. But it's different now. So there are some key differences, but in, in a lot of ways, it's the way it's always been. And NASA still, and I hope that that continues. Now, will that continue or will, will SpaceX go to Mars without NASA, without the partnership and just do it themselves? It's possible. And then you do have to ask yourself questions about, well, what's the, what will be the, the governance structure once we get to Mars? I mean, who's in charge over there? What's the, what's the, what's, what's the, what's the law? Is it maritime law? What, what's the, what, what, what's the legal arrangement? If, if there's a crime committed on Mars, you know, uh, does it, is it fall under, you know, U.S. legal authority? Or, so anyway, there's a lot of questions that, that, that I, I do think will, will be a lot more difficult if it's no longer a partnership. I, I vote for maritime law because, you know, then we can have pirates, right? Um, <laughs> Al, Al Gore. Well, life is always better with pirates. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Al Gore uh, famously argued that if we could all just – see the earth from space, we'd get along a little better. Uh, I'm wondering if your time in space, uh, seeing the earth as a, a barely insulated ball of, of dirt and water changed your perspective once you got back home. Did it change how you think about politics or, you know, being a parent? How did it affect you? Wow. Yeah. So a lot of astronauts talk about this overview effect where you see the Earth from space and realize that all of a sudden that we're all in this together uh, and and that and that have the sense of unity as a human species, which is a wonderful sentiment. And I don't mean to disparage it in any way, but I'm a bit of an outlier because I didn't get this kind of sudden epiphany uh, like a lot of these guys talk about. Um, I looked out the window and, you know, it was nice. <laughs> it was pretty, you know, it was, uh, uh, the oceans were really blue and, and, uh, you know, looking at like the Aurora, that was, that was spectacularly, uh, beautiful, uh, things like that. And watching the orbital, watching the sun come up over the horizon was, was breathtaking, especially once when I did it, when I was uh, out in a spacewalk, that was an incredible, I, I still have that image. I can see it right now. So yes, that was all beautiful, but it didn't lead to this kind of, uh, transformative moment or this overview effect. That, like, this. And I think it's because, um, you know, I, I, I knew this before I left, uh, that fundamentally what makes us all human beings and, and the things that unite us are so much more powerful and important than all the tribal things that, that divide us. So whether that be religion, nationality, race, politics, gender, all those things that divide us, are trivial compared to the fact that we're all fundamentally human beings, created equal, living in the same home, breathing the same air. You shouldn't, in my opinion, have to strap yourself into a rocket and blast off into space and look back at the Earth to realize that one fundamental self-evident truth that, that we're all human beings. And so, yeah, it's great that they talk about it that way, but we should all understand that intrinsically. That way of thinking suggests that if we faced a common threat as a species, those commonalities would would supersede and override our, our petty differences and we'd band together. I mean, you know, the example sometimes given is if uh, aliens invaded, you know, we'd figure out that, yeah, we got to work together. Um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to your perspective, but then I think about a common threat like climate change and our total inability to rise above our petty differences. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm stuck on which side I'm going to fall on. Yeah, I know. So boy, there's a lot of, a lot of things we could talk about there. So yeah, I know like, like, like it would be like independence day, right? If we were invaded, we'd be like, this is now everyone, July 4th is now everyone's independence day, you know, whatever Bill Pullman said. Uh, so yeah, it would be great. Uh, 
But that is a clear and, and present danger uh, where there's no... The, the problem we have with climate change is kind of the old prisoner's dilemma, right? Where uh, you could do... Your country can do great things and, 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 and do lots of, uh, you know, reduce energy consumption and sacrifice and, and, and reduce their carbon footprint. Um, but if the other countries don't follow suit, it's, it's, it's all for nothing, right? So it's, 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 it's this classic... Uh, game theory problem of, of of the prisoner's dilemma, so that's why I think it's, it's proven to be so intractable. Uh, because you know, it, it, it's, why should I why, why should I turn down uh, or turn up my thermostat if if those guys aren't doing it right? Um, so so that's that's the that's the that 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 is a, a problem, and and we have to overcome that because I think it's becoming more and more clear that yes, it's affecting all of us, and that nobody's going to be immune from this problem, uh, and. But it's difficult. I think the key, and one of the things I learned from working with Elon, watching what he did with with Tesla, uh, is the key is not to uh, to uh, to address this all with sticks. And I was just over in Armenia, by the way, and I was hanging out with some climate change scientists and talking about how they realize that they have to understand better how to deal with public policy and public perception because they failed miserably. Because if they just keep saying the sky is falling, well, not the sky is falling, it's not chicken little, it's the sky is actually falling. But if they just keep browbeating everybody, it's not effective. It just, it, 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 it turns people off and it, it, it drives them to inaction, you know, makes them, makes them passive. And one of the things I, I, I learned from, again, from watching Elon with Tesla, which is that you can't just, you have to, there has to be a carrot too. So the way I, I look at this, and, 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 and so the, the Tesla example is, he realized that as long as people were only buying electric cars because uh, they cared about the environment and they were willing to put up with deficiencies, you know, not being able to go as far, not being able to go as fast, uh, being, not being as safe uh, by driving these little tiny basically golf carts, right, that it was never going to catch on and, and it was never going to have mass appeal. So what he said was that we have to do both. We have to make a car that, that uh, addresses climate change and an electric vehicle, but make a car also that is better than the alternatives uh, at the same time and make a car that goes faster, that is sexier, you know, that has better performance, better, uh, better features. Uh, so the, the people will buy the car because it's a better car. And I think we need to do the same thing with climate change. I think we really need to invest heavily in, in, in energy production in a sustainable way. So I want my children and I want the children in, in countries that are developing in the future to use more energy per capita than I do. I want them to crank those air conditioning units up. I want them to, you know, uh, have a bigger house, you know, uh, what, what, whatever, uh, uh, you know, use all that energy, travel around the world in airplanes, do all that. But let's find a way that we can do all that and at the same time not produce greenhouse gas emissions. And I think there is a technical solution if we try hard enough and we can, we can do both. And I think that's how we fix this problem and, 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 and make everybody's life better. Not saying we're going to address climate change and your life's going to have to get worse in the process. We're going to address climate change and your life's going to get better. And I think the policymakers are starting to come around to that. Yeah, I, I, I have always assumed that people in your line of work have just a reflexively optimistic outlook when it comes to, to technology. So it, it really surprised me to hear you talk about Elon Musk's technological pessimism and this idea that the, that the window might, might close. I, I mean, in our politics, we have this same tension. Those who believe that the wheel always turns forward if we keep pushing it, and those who believe that, you know, we could slide back very quickly, very dramatically without even realizing it. Where do you fall in terms of, uh, not just technological optimism, but this idea that the wheel of progress inexorably turns forward. Yeah. So like the, the, was the Martin Luther King quote about the, uh, the arc, arc of justice. justice bending. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think, I think that I certainly, you know, prior to, um, uh, prior to uh, uh, Donald Trump's election, I thought that that arc was bending the right way. And I thought we were on this uh, inexorable march towards a better future where we're going to be more tolerant and we're going to get along better. 
and uh, and and be more sympathetic to each other as as a human species. Um, and then I think anybody that's you know that's seen what's happened in this country over you know the past ten years now, I guess, or the past decade, realizes that no, that progress is much more tenuous and much more fragile, and we could totally backslide uh, and 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 regress. And I, I think. I mean, and, 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 and so we just live through that right here, but it's, that's nothing new. There's plenty of historical examples. Uh, look at Germany after World War II as far as a country that regressed. And, you know, and so, uh, so as far as social progress, um, we, our technology keeps getting better uh, for the most part, uh, you know, at least in, 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 recent, in the recent century. It's, it's been getting better all the time. But our social progress uh, has its ups and downs. And so, it, 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 you know, in a way, you know, if, if you're a, a screenwriter in Hollywood, it's, it's what you want, right? I mean, the, the thing that makes human existence, if you could detach yourself and be objective and, and view it from, a, from, from, like, the moon looking back at Earth as, a, as an alien species just observing the Earth, the thing that makes human life so fascinating is the fact that we have just the right balance of good and evil in our nature to make the outcome completely uncertain, <laughs> right? So we, we could end up, and I, I hope, and I, I am optimistic that we end up in that Star Trek future where we all get along and we're out there, and, and if we do, we're going to be spreading out through the solar system. We're going to go beyond that. Uh, it's inevitable and if we can find a way to get along and solve our problems to, working together, all right? But you could just as easily, I hate to say it, but just as easy could end up in the dystopian future where we're, you know, where we're, uh, we're either we're fighting our own machines like the Terminator or, or we're, we, we're the, the, the few survivors of a nuclear war. There's a lot of very bleak possible outcomes, too. And I don't know. I don't know. I, I, but, but as far as what world do I want for my children, I think that's obvious. And I, I would hope that we would all want that. Uh, so there's got to be some way of of getting back on track. Are you a particular kind of sci-fi nerd? You've, you've mentioned Star Trek twice now. Is that the vein you, you would put yourself in, or are you more of a Star Wars guy? I've heard you like Kubrick as well, which is its own very, very narrow niche. Uh, where, do you, where do you fit? So yeah, no, I, I'm a. I'll play both sides on this one too. I I, I like. I, I also am a, a big fan of Star Wars as well. As well, I like Star Trek and Star Wars. I'm working on a TV show right now for all mankind, so that's my current obsession. Uh, but it's also my job, so I'm a little biased there. Um, that's uh, it's on Apple TV, by the way, four ninety nine a month. Sign up. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, uh, so but actually, if you ask me what my uh, we, we did this. I remember when we were getting together early with NASA, it was a really hard time. My, one of my biggest challenges at SpaceX was getting SpaceX and NASA, who had two completely different corporate cultures, to work together and to get along. And, uh, and so we were having kind of like this big meeting right when we started to get really serious about flying NASA astronauts on SpaceX rockets. And to kind of like try to break the ice, I had everybody go around the table and say, what's your favorite science fiction movie or space movie. And when it came to me, I didn't say like Star Wars or Wrath of Khan or even Apollo 13. Those were all the, those are probably the favorites. I said Galaxy Quest because, uh, because I like the funny, I like the funny stuff. And, uh, uh, so, so Galaxy Quest, I think, I, I think is the best space movie of all time. <laughs> For All Mankind is an alternative history series about what, things would look like if the Soviets, if the Russians beat the Americans uh, to the moon. I have heard you talk about all the conspiracy theories are out there, mostly the ones that are related to the moon landing. And you've said that you used to be flattered by them, but now they worry you. Can you explain? Yeah. So back in the good old days, when the nut jobs out there were just focused on uh, that the moon landing was fake. <laughs> back, back in the fun old days when uh, it was relatively benign, I almost took it as a compliment. I really did because I thought, wow, you know, we did something so improbable. And, you know, we, a lot of us take it for granted. But if you, if you think back to, let's say, I guess it was, uh, was it 
uh, I want to say 1961 or 62, when, when, when JFK first gave his speech to a joint session of Congress where he said, we're going to go to the moon in this decade and yeah. do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they are high, right? Um, <laughs> I, and, and by the way, my, my, my son one day threw that back in my face. He said, I told him to clean his room. He said, Dad, I will clean my room, not because it is easy, but because it is high. <laughs> <laughs> Smart ass. But, but anyway, uh, uh, when he said that, uh, to that, he said it twice. First time was to a joint session of Congress. And at that point, do you know how much time Americans had logged in, in space? Uh, no, moment? I don't, but probably not much. 15 minutes and I believe 22 <laughs> seconds, which is the total length of Alan, Alan Shepard's Shepard. initial yeah. suborbital flight. That's all we had. And he said, within 10 years, we're going to be walking down the moon and coming back. And that's crazy, all right? That is, I, I assert that that is actually much more aspirational than anything that Elon or Jeff or Richard has ever said. And that's, and that's saying a lot, right? Uh, but, but the amazing thing is that we did it, and now we kind of take it for granted. But that was so hard to do back then. Uh, we're having a hard time doing it again, and all, you know, all these years later. So, so I think, you know, I, when people said, oh, it was a hoax, it was on a soundstage in, in Hollywood or whatever, I, I kind of took it as a compliment because it was like, wow, we did something so hard. They're still, even today, having a difficult time with all the evidence and, and video and everything. They're still having a hard time wrapping their heads around the fact that we actually pulled it off. That's kind of cool, you know. So I thought that. Um, but, but what changed over the years is like this, this fringe movement of conspiracy theorists started entering the mainstream over the past decade, right? And you started, started getting these crazy conspiracies about JFK Jr. still being alive or, uh, you know, some pizza parlor in D.C. that's uh, human trafficking or with Hillary Clinton and all this crazy, insane stuff. And it became, uh, you know, it, it conspiracy theories became part of certain governments' official foreign policy. I mean, Putin's doing it right now with the denazification of of Ukraine and everything, right? It's no longer funny, all right? That the, I could laugh at the guys in the tinfoil hats that said we didn't go to the moon. But now that it's, now that it's corrupting our society and amplified by social media, it's, it's a clear danger to our democracy. And, I, and, and now any, any kind of conspiracy theorist, uh, you know, I just find it really no longer a, 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 remotely a laughing matter. What do we do about it? I mean, clearly... There are influencers and, and leaders and politicians who are instigating and, and provoking these these wild theories. Not sure how much control we have at that level, but is there something culturally um, or policy oriented in terms of education that we can do to prepare people for a, a world that is so confusing in terms of information flows and sources? Boy, Ken, I really, really wish I had a good answer to that question. Uh, unfortunately, I have to admit I don't. Um, it seems like just making sure the truth gets out there, fact-checking and so forth, doesn't really work. Um, it seems that uh, the people who buy into this stuff, no matter how, you know, the stuff is, is so easily objectively disproven, you know, even like flat earthers and stuff. I mean, you could... There's, 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 uh, you know, the ancient Greeks did scientific experiments that proved that the earth is, is round. Okay. A sphere. Um, so it's not like sharing that information or knowledge changes their mind. So what will, I mean, I think I don't know. It's, 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 and, and it's, it's the, it's the, it's the fundamental conundrum facing all the people that run these, the, our, our social media platforms that where so much of this goes on. How at what point do you you know do you, do do you shut it down uh, and and if you do shut it down, does that just make it worse because then that confirms that oh you know they're they're that we're right it just proves we're right because they're you know I I I have uh, people who will hand me stuff that they print out uh, and I ask them well, why don't you just send me the link and they and they say well oh no no because uh, they they banned it <laughs> I'm like well shouldn't that tell you something you know uh, and 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 uh, but it doesn't stop them so. Boy, can I, if you figure this out, please let me know. If you, I, I would ask every guest on your podcast that question. Maybe somebody will have a solution, but unfortunately, I don't. Well, I, I want to end on a slightly 
um, elevated note, you've walked in space. And I put a similar question to, to combat vets sometimes. Um, and I'm wondering if it applies to astronauts. When you've had that life-changing adrenaline rush, um, does normal life pale in comparison? Is it hard uh, to to go back down to Earth, in your case, literally, not just metaphorically, and try to live a normal life? Wow. Well, well for the first, I want to make a distinction because you brought up combat, and and that is that uh, I get I get kind of embarrassed when when sometimes I'll be introduced to give a talk or something, and they'll say, "Now nah, there's an American hero," uh, and and I want to, there's a big difference in what I did, what I what you did, Ken, because nobody was shooting at me. All right, so <laughs> I, I was yes, thirty thousand feet and, above it, so I, I I was pretty clear of it. But keep going. <laughs> you know, there's, they, they have these missiles, you know. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> I can get that. High. But. Uh, but uh, so people, you know, so I did what I did and it was risky, but I did it because I was so excited about it and I loved doing it. I wanted to do it. And 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 uh, and, and I was really motivated um, personally uh, as well as altruistically. But but it was a, a, per, a selfish side of it, too. I wanted the adventure, the excitement. Uh, somebody goes out there because they're doing it at a sense of duty and patriotism for their country and are putting themselves in that harm's way. Uh, you know, not just because they're off on a grand personal adventure, but because they're doing it for a higher cause. That is true hero- heroism, okay? And I, I cannot equate what I did to that. It, it would be completely wrong. So I just want to draw that line. Uh, but having said that, as far as the excitement and the adrenaline rush, uh, it was awesome. Don't get me wrong. And I miss it. I, I do miss uh, the excitement of being up in space and, and oh, doing a spacewalk. Nothing beats that. And, and uh uh, fly, even flying around in T thirty eights, I miss that because, but but all those things are were fantastic life experiences, and and what excites me is I still, they might not be to the same scale, but I still get a lot of enjoyment and a lot of adrenaline rush out of flying my little piston airplane. My I have a Cirrus, uh, and and I fly that thing around, and uh, on on some days that can be just as challenging as flying a T thirty eight, given what it, depending on what the scenario. And um, I still enjoy, you know, going on hikes and, and exploring new mountains and, and doing all those kinds of th- outdoor things. And, and so I still get my, my fix, if you will, uh, that way. And it might not be as to the same magnitude as it used to be. But, but I, there's so many other things in life that are so worthwhile. And I have a family now. I have kids. And, and just uh, being a dad uh, is another great adventure uh, that I really enjoy. So... Uh, the, the great one of the best pieces of advice I got when I was still at NASA thinking about going to SpaceX was first of all you only get to leave the astronaut office once, and second of all, uh, always don't go whenever you're making a move like this or change don't go away from something, go towards something you know always be excited and find something to do in, in your future that you are passionate about uh, and make you happy and and. And given everything that happened at SpaceX, I, 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 would, I would have to say that mission was accomplished. <laughs> so so uh, I think that's the key. Awesome. Well, it's been so great having you. I've got a, a note here. Um, once we're done saving democracy, uh, let's make sure we get pizza in space. So that'll be, uh, that'll be the next <laughs> yes, thing. Please. <laughs> Thanks again, Garrett. Yes, that would be a great improvement. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Burn the Boats. I've got a quick favor to ask. If you haven't already, click the link below to the podcast page and leave a five-star rating on iTunes. It's amazing how important those reviews are in growing shows like this and getting our message out. Thanks for the help. Midas Touch is unapologetically pro-democracy. And look, we know you are too. So please make sure you check out our best-selling shirt and our best-selling gear, the unapologetically pro-democracy gear. And hey, while you're at it, make sure you check out my favorite shirt and one of our most famous designs. It wasn't rigged. You're just a loser at store.midastouch.com. That's store.midastouch.com.